So yes, um, I'm going to talk um, about a couple of reports that we have done for the Plant Health Centre on pesticide withdrawals. Um, so thinking about the economic impacts and then a second report which looked more at case studies. So pesticide withdrawals, I mean, Jerry mentioned it in his introduction. It comes up all the time uh, as an issue, um, both for users, but also, you know, there are perceptions around pesticides. Their use is maybe not quite as controversial as um, genetic modification, but it's still something that the public has opinions about. Um, and it, it appears in many of the examples that, that uh, stakeholders are raising uh, with regards to the threats. So for example, in agriculture, a lot of issues or concerns at the moment um, around virus problems as a result and a consequence of some of the recent withdrawals of um, aphicide type products. So really, um, I'm probably teaching many of you to suck eggs here, but uh, just to give the background to what I'll talk about today, pesticides are widely used across all our plant health sectors. Um, so agriculture, horticulture, forestry, amenity and the natural environment. And obviously their availability and use is very closely regulated. So looking for environmental impacts and impacts on, on human health primarily. Um, Previously, we've obviously been part of a European regulatory regime, but as of this year, as of the 1st of January, the UK has its own independent regulatory regime managed by the, the Health and Safety Executive, and they manage on behalf of all four uh, country administrations, so they uh, are managing for Scotland as well. So, you know, we can think about the withdrawals of, of pesticides that will lead to reduced output values and additional costs um, in the various sectors that we're concerned about today. Um, but the additional concerns around pesticide withdrawals are that there are potential impacts on some of the, the policy objectives of Scottish government. So, for example, uh, objectives relating to vibrant rural economies, um, more tree planting, the growth of the food and drink sectors. If, if that is challenged by increased cost and reduced output values, there are issues. Although obviously that has to be balanced against the, the policy interests to protect human and environmental health. And nobody's arguing that that is not important. So the two reports that I'm drawing on in this presentation, um, the first one was done by uh, a colleague, Andy Evans. So this looked at the potential impacts uh, arising from pesticide withdrawals, and it's a huge report um, that carries a lot of you know, very substantial information. What we then did with that was um, produce a, a second report, which actually looked more at um, how people have reacted uh, to withdrawals. Uh, and it's perhaps a slightly more digestible report. It's a shorter report, but it pulls more on um, you know, the mitigations and the behaviours uh, that, that um, have already been put into place, for examples, uh, that have been withdrawn. So those are the two reports um, that, like I say, the, the presentation is, is drawn from today. And just to say a little bit about the methods that we used, because it's not an easy thing to do to estimate uh, losses uh, attributed to, to pesticides. So we use the Scottish pesticide data um, prepared by, by SASA, so that gives a, a very strong uh, source for agriculture and production horticulture. We use forest research information uh, for forestry and, you know, for things like um, public use, it's actually quite hard to get data on what's used, so we drew on some health and safety uh, data on what the public buy and use. So then we looked at the active substances of greatest importance in each sector, and we looked at those and cross-referenced that with an analysis of, of the at-risk substances that, uh, again, SASA um, keep, and there is a, a database maintained by AHDB. And then we graded actives as at low, medium, or high risk of withdrawal. So, you know, in the high-risk category, um, you know, there could be very significant issues, critical issues around, you know, carcinogenic effects um, flagged by EFSA uh, in, in Europe. In the medium category, the pesticides might 
um, have perhaps some data gaps um, or they might have, you know, be failing in, in one category. Um, and then in the low category, there were no flagged risks. We generally went with that, but we did try and capture some of the, if you like, softer pieces around something like glyphosate, where there are, you know, on a straightforward assessment, it doesn't flag particular dangers, but there's that very strong uh, political and public perception around glyphosate use. So we we would class it as, as moderate because, you know, there are those side issues. Um, we used industry generated evidence of upper bound impacts on, on the, the losses to frame the impact of those pesticide losses. So again, that was quite a complex process um, to find those upper bound impacts. And it's important to recognize that they are the upper bound impacts. So when I get onto charts, I'll, I'll come back to that point. And then we tried to weight those impacts to the Scottish risks. So we consulted with key stakeholders to say, um, whether these generally UK data were of more or, or less importance in the Scottish scenario. And then, like I say, in that second report, we looked at the mitigations actually taken up by Scottish growers and tried to set out some of the other considerations and then come up with some findings and conclusions. So this chart here is looking at the, the commonly used active substances across the different sectors and how we estimated them to be at low, medium or high risk of withdrawal. So you can see there, if we take something like arable uh, on the left-hand side of the chart there, um, we've got 12 products at high risk of withdrawal, um, 18 products at, at moderate risk, and then the remainder of those top 50 um, we're classing as low risk. So that looks uh, fairly impactful, but you can then look across the sectors and see um, for something like soft fruit, in fact, it's the majority of the pesticides in that sector that are at risk. Um, grass and fodder crops, again, uh, you know, significant withdrawals in that sector. Again, the field veg. So you're seeing a pattern here that some of these uh, smaller crops uh, are, you know, very, very at risk from high or, or moderate risk of withdrawals. So if you imagine a a worst case scenario where both the high and the, the medium risk are withdrawn, you know, these sectors are left with very few um, products. Um, you can look across to, you know, amenity veg, uh, and you can look at the natural environment uh, and amateur use. Uh, and again, you know, it's significant um, proportions of the actives that are going to be withdrawn. So if we turn that to the, the estimated impact on output values. And again, for some sectors, there are no uh, calculated output values. So it, it's harder to draw those conclusions. So we're looking mainly here at agriculture. Um, again, you can see that the, the charts change slightly. So for all, we had quite significant withdrawals around the arable crops. It's a significant loss, but actually there's quite a big chunk of that output value is retained even under a worst case scenario. But again, if you look across to some of the other crops, um, legumes being a particular example, that's almost half um, of the output value at risk if, if we go through a worst case scenario. Potatoes fairly heavily impacted. Uh, and again, you're looking at those soft fruit examples where um, the loss of, of pesticides um, that's predicted are really very, very significant. This is just a slightly easier or perhaps more depressing way of looking at that same data. Um, so we're just looking at those um, losses, but as a, a percentage of the total. Um, so again, it really flags the, the soft fruit risks there where, um, you know, 60 to 80 percent of strawberry and raspberry production at risk uh, under these um, predicted scenarios. And that, you know, clearly uh, if it was to be enacted is, uh, you know, makes those sectors unviable. Um, but some of the conclusions that we got to in writing this report, so these are industry generated estimates uh, of the upper bound impact of withdrawal. And they also assume um, that the pest uh, disease uh, and weed risks are in a steady state so that they occur every year. 
And the other key thing that I will come back to is that it assumes that all these uh, pesticides at high and medium risk are withdrawn simultaneously and at the same time. And we have had a few examples where um, we've had very rapid loss of, of pesticides. But I'll come back to the point that actually it's unlikely that they will all be withdrawn in, in one flash and that this ability to adapt uh, is perhaps an important feature that we can think about going forward. So if I just um, look at some of the particular issues uh, sector by sector, um, so this is looking at forestry uh, and the number of active substances that we thought about. Um, and then um, thinking of some of the particular issues um, that forestry is likely um, to be threatened with. So you can see there that some of the immediate um, risks are around the withdrawal of, of some of the pesticides, where even a 1% a reduction in value um, can be estimated to be just short of 10 million pounds loss. And then, you know, we can look at other um, estimates of, you know, there are those immediate loss to trees, but you can um, draw on wider figures that would actually say that on a UK level, the, the losses could be much higher. Now, there are alternatives there um, in some of the neo neonicotinoid active substances uh, and the use of biologicals like um, nematodes. But that is, you know, an alternative and a, a complex um, and specialist thing to put in place. Weed control, again, becomes a, a key feature. So you see there, you know, a predicted loss around um, propizamid. Um, and clearly that's an example where if we also lost glyphosate, there would be a greatly exacerbated issue there. So, um, you know, that's, you know, one example. It's harder to put um, figures on the nursery sector here um, but again, we can think about things like the loss of um, uh, insecticides there and, and a threat to the survival of young trees. Uh, and we have very limited off-label use uh, and the use of, of emus. And again, uh, stakeholders talk about just the expense uh, and the training that would be needed to instigate uh, more biological control methods. If we look at the natural environment uh, and the ornamental and horticulture sector, again, there are you know, some very specific uh, issues that, that stakeholders talk about. Um, so we have um, particular risks around some of the multi-site uh, fungicides. Uh, and again, uh, issues around aphid and whitefly control come through. Weed control, again, comes through as a real concern uh, in this um, scenario. So, you know, those withdrawals coupled with a reduction in the extensions of authorization, these, these emus really have a very significant impact on the sector. Um, and that, you know, some of these sectors are very intensively managed. And again, there's a resistance risk issue on the back of having a narrower spectrum of pesticides. This is a sector that's quite innovative and where we're likely to see uh, increased uptake of, of biologicals but that does come with increased costs to producers and ultimately to the consumers. Um, and thinking about the natural environment sector, I mean, the main issues there are around the control of invasive species, where, as Ian's alluded to, there are probably positives to the withdrawal um, of pesticides in the natural environment, but there are also cost, uh, cost implications uh, in terms of um, managing invasive species. And then if we look at the amenity sector, again, it's harder to attach values to this. Um, but, you know, the aesthetic improvement of conservation areas is, is a, you know, a feature. And if we look at something like the Oxford Economic Report there, they estimated a ban, uh, a cost attached to, to glyphosate removal that would add at least 228 million to the UK's council tax bill. So £7.80 per household. So again, you know, the, there are very real uh, costs attached to alternatives. So the initial recommendations from that report were um, to promote, you know, the increased uptake of alternatives and integrated pest management and to really give special consideration to some of the impacted sectors. And that we spend more time thinking about how we can actually steward and conserve the remaining active in ingredients. 
um, and the training and, and knowledge exchange that would go on on the back of that are, of course, um, very critical. So in the second report, we acknowledge that these were worst case uh, industry outcome uh, generated figures. And we thought more about the timing uh, and tried to think about staggered phasing and withdrawals and to look at uh, what people had actually done to adapt to existing examples. Um, so, you know, clearly to balance the negatives around what I've been saying, Scottish uh, producers will not be the only ones impacted by um, uh, pesticide withdrawals. So if we're on a level market, the impacts are less. Um, some of those uh, impacts will be offset by market level dynamics. So a lot of this depends on where we go with, with trade deals. Um, the issues around Aussie drape, you know, give particular illustrations where, you know, we are probably not competing on a level, well, we know we're not competing on a level playing field. And, you know, the withdrawal of ne neonicotinoids has made it challenging in the UK, particularly in the south of the UK, and we're still importing from elsewhere. So even if some of those estimated upper bound impacts are, are realised, it does slightly overstate the economic um, case. But certainly we know that the transition would be very locally disruptive and, and would uh, hamper some of the, the policy objectives that I've, that I've highlighted. So when we looked at some of the adaptations that growers had already made to the examples there, so we worked through um, four examples of, of um, withdrawals. So if we think about the withdrawals around the neonicotinoids um, in Aussie drape, uh, particularly in Scotland, um, growers have compensated there by um, moving to pyrethroid sprays. Um, that's has its own issues because uh, resistance to pyrethroid sprays is widespread. Um, and, you know, we've seen this disruption to the Aussie drape uh, trade where really the market has collapsed and, and we're now uh, importing heavily. A lot of calls there to uh, adapt that uh, legislation and mitigate the disruption. But we do acknowledge that pressures uh, around things like flea beetles are currently lower in Scotland you know, climate change notwithstanding. But yeah, that move, that reactive move to pyrethroid sprays is, you know, is the strong uh, feature that came out there. Similarly for clopyrifos, so that was a re relatively rapid withdrawal uh, of, a, of an insecticide. Um, and again, there's very little uh, in terms of alternatives there. So that has left a real gap in the control um, that's there. But again, you see pyrethroid sprays coming through as the, you know, the preferred method. Diquat uh, as a withdrawal. Um, so you see there flailing, which carries, you know, significant extra costs for potato growers, increased um, use of uh, fuels and so on, and a slower kill. So worry about additional uh, spread of bacterial um, diseases. Um, so the worry there that it may actually disincentivise growers of alternative crops, which becomes an issue in Scotland where we're relatively tight for um, rotational um, uh, choices anyway. And linearon is an example of a, of a herbicide there where, again, a very rapid withdrawal exposes the industry to, to loss ahead of, of new product evolution. So again, I'm leading up to this idea that if we move more slowly on this, we have more time to adapt. So from those case studies, we conclude that mitigations to date have largely been very reactive. There's not been pre-planning and, and we've had to jump to other uh, pesticide use to, to compensate. And there's a limit to the mitigation effectiveness. So again, you know, I've used the example of the oil seed rate there where the sudden withdrawal has really disrupted a market. Um, the adoption of, of alternative control measures um, is, you know, can be positive, but, you know, the example of diquat there where it, it carries additional passes and additional um, costs. And we do have this concern about um, impacts on what we would term the alternative crops in Scotland and the ones that add to our rotational availability. Everything, again, coming through in these reports was just the difficulty in upscaling some of the biological alternative solutions um, and that, you know, some sectors are, are very 
um, much more at risk than others. So, you know, again, we, we've concluded, um, you know, we know these upper bound impacts um, could be mitigated by staggered withdrawals over time that let the market adapt and let alternative adoptions um, come through. IPM will certainly help. Um, and then, you know, we need to go forward balancing policy interests. Um, you know, again, coming back to the point that there's a reason why pesticides are, are heavily regulated. So we left these points for consideration um, that we um, move slowly, we prolong the availability of key active substances where safety concerns allow, we accelerate the R&D efforts uh, around the, the implementation of alternatives, we explicitly support um, training and funding around IPM, uh, and we think as you know, stakeholders about the strategic stewardship of actives. So perhaps we can retain them for longer if we're careful with them. And that's a point of consideration around something like glyphosate. Um, the current policy encouragement for IPM is relatively light touch. Um, so that could perhaps be expanded to different sectors. And you know, we work more strongly with stakeholders on that. And we pay specific attention to sectors that are more exposed to withdrawal risks. Ian's highlighted some of the reports um, that the Plant Health Centre has done around working with stakeholders and targeting knowledge exchange. So this uh, identification, the IPM uh, is much more rapidly taken up, more aware people are of it, is driving some of our Plant Health Centre uh, knowledge exchange strategies. And just to finish with the, you know, to emphasise how key it is that we work with others, some of the groups that are particularly involved in thinking about pesticides uh, and how we continue to work together to really think about how we can um, phase withdrawals and accelerate the use of alternatives and really um, pick up uh, IPM measures uh, and mitigate some of these uh, damaging costs that, that we are concerned about. Thank you. I will try and stop sharing. Thanks very much, Fiona. And I think we've got time for, for, for one question. I'm going to hand over to Chris Quine, who's going to be the question master for today. Yes. Chris. Thanks very much, Pete, and thanks, Fiona, for that. Uh, one question uh, related, I think, to your, you touched on R&D efforts regarding alternatives, but there's a question's yeah. come in saying, Clearly, one of the problems has been the slow development of low risk alternatives. And the question is, is this likely to improve? And perhaps the supplementary is, how is it likely to improve? So it came through really strongly at the moment, the, the difficulty in upscaling, particularly the biological alternatives. So they are suited to um, controlled environments and high cost um, small units but they're very hard to implement at scale and that we can't pretend that that's going to go away I mean there is much more interest um, so I think I'm going to sit on the fence with my answer Chris and say it will get better but I don't see the use of for example biological alternatives being a complete replacement and the strength will be where we learn to use them as part of programs with other things um, and that's, that's a direction um, where we're going. But again, there is a focus on major crops uh, and less of a focus on some of the smaller, um, I'm thinking particularly in an agricultural context here, where we really do need to pick up for the soft fruit example, say. Uh, and I know in the forestry sector, Chris, you're thinking more about IPM and how it gets picked up. Um, so yeah, much to do. And, and there's general context, I guess, the pipeline of active chemical ingredients is slowing, is it? Yes, yes. So we know that it's not going to get easier to put products on the market. And again, if you're thinking of large multinational companies, there are long odds attached to developing pesticides now. Um, fortunately, people are still interested in that. It's, it's a market that's there, but it's... It, we're not going to get the sort of renewed pipeline and they will certainly be, you know, examples that include some of the multi-site um, pesticides. We're never going to get that type of product again. 
Great, thank you. Thanks, Pete. Thanks very much both.